presentation, we're going to talk to you about the tragedy of the commons. And I'm Dennis Sober, this is Hick Nilsson, and Ludwig Nixlom. So, so the agenda for this presentation is that we'll first discuss or explain to you the history, where the concept arises from, and then we'll talk more about the concept, and then we'll talk about the limitations and some uh, real-world examples. And then we'll finish up with a summary and a conclusion. So, first, history. <clears throat> uh, William Foster Lloyd was uh, a British writer on uh, economics, and in 1833 he published uh, a paper, some pamphlet, where he discussed the overuse of common resource. And in this uh, example, he he used. Uh, he, he talked about herders sharing a common resource, which was grass. And uh, adding an animal to this uh, field, where the herders shared the grass, would uh, you know, lead to more profit for the owner. But it could lead to overgrazing and to be a detriment to the whole. And uh, <clears throat> another person, whose name is Garrett Harden, who we'll talk about later, he explained this uh, with the help of the utility function. As, as sort of a complex system where he said that as a rational being, each herdsman se seeks to maximize his gain explicitly or implicitly, more or less consciously. He asks, what is the utility t uh, to me of adding one more animal to my herd? Uh, this utility has one negative and one positive uh, component. Uh, each man is locked into a system that compels him to increase his herd without limits in a world that is limited. So, first of all, the positive component is uh, a function of the increment of one animal. And since the herdsman receives all of the uh, proceeds from the sale of the additional animal, uh, the positive utility is nearly plus one. And the negative component is uh, a function of the additional overgrazing created by one or more animals since, uh, since, however, the effects of the overgrazing are shared by all the herdsmen, the negative utility for the for any particular decision-making herdsman is only a fraction of one. Uh, yes, the person who said this was Garrett Hardin, and uh, he he kind of coined the term the tragedy of the commons in because he wrote the article tragedy of the commons in 1968, where tragedy in this case means that it is not the unhappiness, it, uh, tra the tragedy resides in the solemnity of the remorseless of <coughs> working things. So what he meant uh, with the tragedy of the commons was basically, as the, uh, the example he read from Lloyd, uh, William Foster Lloyd, was that uh, he thought that this had no technical solution, because a technical solution, as he said it, was one that requires only a change in only the techniques of natural sciences, demanding little or nothing in the way of change in human values, ideas, uh, or ideas of morality. And he, he also worked a lot with uh, overpopulation. It was obviously a big concern of his that we overpopulated the world and that we exhausted the world's resources, which are limited. And for this, he thought that. Freedom in a commons would uh, bring ruin to all, uh, because if if we overpopulated or kept on overpopulating, we would use the world's resources in the, in the way that we seem fit with that sort of freedom. We would uh, eventually use it uh, in a not efficient way, and we would deplete the resources uh, so that they couldn't heal up. The, the world couldn't heal, uh, and he even went uh, as far as to say that freedom to breed was uh, intolerable. And with this, he meant that, uh, uh, or uh, especially since the welfare state uh, came into play, that uh, when uh, in previously, like in old times, when uh, people uh, were breeding, and they, they, they had a lot of children, and if this was bad, then they would be naturally punished. Because if, if you had a family and you couldn't take care of them all, then they, they would die, and that would be a natural punishment. But he was worried that their welfare state saved 
a lot of these, and that lead, lead to an overpopulation. And he explained this by, uh, for example, the uh, Chinese expression which said, uh, a picture is, says more than a thousand words, but he meant that sometimes you need a thousand words to justify the picture, because even though an act might seem good, uh, he meant that if you don't know what the act looks like in the whole picture, in the whole system, it might not be good in the end, for example. He talked about overpopulation, so in the end, overpopulation might ruin us all, but that is his view. And uh, this might not even be true, which we will talk about later, how overpopulation occurs. And yes, I'm going to talk about uh, population growth. Uh, uh, one of the greatest uh, dangers we face as a race is overpopulation. No matter how much we effectivize our industry or minimize our footprint on the nature, uh, nature will always have a natural carrying capacity. Uh, we can both maximize the material quality of life and population simultaneously. And as we increase our population, the available calorie must decrease over time. Uh, so to survive, we must create a sustainable future, and we have to somehow control the population. Uh, so the dynamics of the population is then an interaction between the quality of life, carrying capacity, rate of starvation, etc. There are certain examples of uh, 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 population control, uh, both modern ones and ancient ones. For example, yeah. oh, no. uh, like China's one-child policy, which is an obvious way to try to control the population. But especially in ancient times, where the, the case was Sparta which was considered one of the best populated cities in Greece. And they managed to... Uh, they managed to, to keep a population size by uh, encouraged emigration when the population was too high and uh, incentivized immigration when it started to get too low. And the reason why they wanted to uh, the specific population size is because they wanted an effective administration and a high, uh, high rate of citizen participation in uh, public affairs. shows that regulating the dynamics of the system, the dynamics of the population can be incentivized. Uh, this specific example of uh, Sparta cannot be used today as emigrating people would only relocate the problem of overpopulation. Uh, the use of resources uh, must be better in the world and it's, uh, in human nature we try to maximize our gain but it's uh, shown that, uh, for example, in small villages, such as uh, Hutterite colonies, uh, the, demand in, uh, the demand for more gain is actually managed through something called chain. And it's something that Dennis talked about with the uh, utility function. The utility of more gain is less than the utility for chain. And it shows that uh, the low population uh, has a different dynamics uh, than in large systems. <coughs> and something that we act according to today is that a system of individuals pursuing their private interest will automatically serve the collective interest. Uh, but applying this in reality will be disastrous 
And uh, as Dennis uh, talked about before, Gary Hardin used the metaphor of caveat of commons to show why. When a resource is held in common, with many people having own ownership and access to it, for the reason that the self-interest rational agent will decide to increase its own exploitation of the common, while gaining the full benefit of it. But the cost of that uh, increase is shared among all users. Uh, the tragic result of each person thinking this way is actually the ruin of the commons and also everyone using it. And to apply this on the population problem, each couple uh, expects to get the full experience of uh, uh, having another child, but only a little of the social and uh, ecological cost of it. So the problem of, have, of, of the population could lie with the benefit of having another child. And Hardy's solution to this would be to abandon the common system altogether through, for example, privatization and uh, uh, stricter laws. Uh, and they also assumed that if it weren't for welfare, uh, larger families would have to pay more for the breeding, and thus uh, small families, families would be incentivized. Uh, however, Hans Rosling, a Swedish medical doctor, shows that the most effective way to control the population growth is actually by the use of welfare. Uh, you might have seen his TED talk uh, where he talked about that increasing, increasing child survivability actually decreases population size. Uh, and this is because if you want your child to uh, survive and grow old themselves, uh, you don't need that many children to make sure that at least one of them survives. And uh, by increasing the welfare, Hans Rosling thinks that the population size will stagnate. Stagnate about 9 billion people, and hopefully, this is just below the net natural carrying capacity for it, or Earth. And now, Dennis will talk about another example. Yeah, um, I'll hop in now. Yeah, understand. Um, how does this work? tragedy of the commons relates to fish and cod especially. Because um, there is a school book example of the tragedy of the commons. Um, and in 1992, um, the Canadian minister, I'm going to say this right, of fisheries and oceans, John Crosby, he declared uh, a moratorium on the northern cod fishery. This is, was an industry that for the past 500 years had, had largely shaped the lives and communities of Canada's east coast. The problem was that in the summer of 1992, uh, the northern Atlantic cod biomass fell to 1% of its earlier level. And Canada's federal government uh, saw that this relationship had been, has been pushed to the limit and to a breaking po point where it was kind of a point of no return. And they declared this moratorium on the cod fishing and this ended the 500 year run that they had had in this region with Northern Cod. Um, academics have highlighted three contributing factors to why this depletion of the cod stock happened. We are going to start by investing in the technological factors and this was definitely one of the major factors. Um, 
because during the 19th century, the 20th century, uh, fish, the fishing industry blew up. Uh, we introduced uh, equipment and technology that increased the volume of landed fish. Uh, for the previous centuries, the local fishermen had used very modest and easy technology that limited the volume of their catch, the area in which they could fish. But it also made them uh, able to, uh, to hunt for or fish for very, very distinct sizes and species of fish. Uh, but from the 1950s onwards, and we can kind of follow this in, in the graph, uh, new technology was introduced, and this allowed fishermen to troll larger areas, fish to greater depths for a greater time, but also with much less granularity. So the largest problem in this was that uh, they were not fishing only cod, but other species of fish that was a uh, totally economically unimportant for the cod fishing industry, but it was a substantial part of the ecosystem that uh, kind of balanced up the, uh, the cod biomass. And from the 1960s onwards, uh, very po powerful uh, trawlers were introduced and they started fishing with uh, boats equipped with radar, electronic sonars, uh, navigation systems, and this was kind of a historically unparalleled success, and uh, the Canadian uh, catches, they peaked, as we can see here, in the early 1970s. But uh, the new technologies affected uh, the cod population in two important ways. Uh, first, as I said, by increasing the area and depth of, uh, that was fished. And what happened was that the cod that was being depleted by the fish industry uh, couldn't uh, replenish enough from year to year uh, <coughs> from the quantity that was taken out of the ocean. And secondly, what I also mentioned, that uh, one caught enormous amount of fish that was substantial uh, for the reproduction of the cod, but totally economically unimportant. Um, and this is what we call bycatch in fishing terms. And this really undermined the whole balance of the ecosystem. And you can quite easily mold this, as you all know, as a predator-prey system. And it was really pushed to its breaking point. Second factor that was contributing to this was the ecological uncertainty. Because it's hugely hard to measure uh, a real ecosystem and what's going on in and managing such, such an ecosystem is an extremely complex task. There are a multitude of interests, uh, perspectives, different sources of information that, to take into account. And knowledge of a research source uh, as uh, a fish population is very limited because they are underwater. Um, and it's also clouded by precision. And it really makes the task of, of managing a fish resource difficult. Newfoundlands, uh, cod fisheries uh, were really no exceptions to this. Um, they had a very imperfect understanding of the ocean ecosystem. One haven't really seen a system collapse uh, on a level like this before. And the technical and environmental challenges associated with observing the ecosystem uh, led to very incomplete data of the cod population. And also, as we know from modeling uh, simple predator prey systems, we know that there is a naturally high variability in the population dynamic here. And that's also kind of hard to, to take into effect, and one didn't really do this at this time. So this all combined made it very hard for government to, to predict the, the collapse of the ecosystem and also hard to take action. And this led to prediction about the cost that were really, really uncertain. So the government didn't really take any course of action in time. Third, we're looking at socioeconomic factors, because this was a really old industry on the Can Canadian East Coast. And Newfoundland, uh, it was really a source of social and cultural identity. Uh, most of families living there, uh, it, the fishery was really a substantial part of their 
uh, and most of the families who lived there were, were involved in, in the industry directly or indirectly as fishermen, fish plant workers, fish, this is like a word trick, uh, fish sellers, fish transporters or employees in a related business. Um, and additionally, a lot of common companies, both foreign and domestic, had uh, invested heavily in boats, equipment, and uh, infrastructure <coughs> and fishery. And this, uh, they really felt it was in their best interest to maintain a high level uh, of open access uh, fishing. So, in the end, this has really become like a schoolbook example uh, of the unfortunate paradox that also often comes with open access resources and which is known as the tragedy of the commons uh, stated by, by Hardy in his, in his earlier article. And this is the situation where individuals' best interest isn't aligned uh, with the long-term interest of the common society. And in Newfoundland particularly, and in, in this uh, example, it, it meant that, I mean, Individuals wanted to maximize their, their own investment and, and interest from, from participating in the cod fishery. Uh, but this uh, led to a dramatic collapse of, of a whole ecosystem and it still hasn't replenished to date. And in the end, uh, this left everybody worse off uh, than with their uh, individual outcome. It's also interesting uh, to consider other examples of, of tragedy of the commons uh, that are not uh, related to, to ecology. Uh, it's, e it's easy to think of climate or, or climate change as, as, or population dynamics maybe as a typical tragedy of the commons example. But we can see it in lots of other industries as well, which is interesting. Uh, one thing I think about is uh, email spamming. That, that really influences the way we use email. Like th this is a, a problem that we're Taking, uh, taking care of a lot, lots better today than before, but it, it has really affected how email is used and how the reliability of the system. Another such example is DDoS attacks, uh, distributed denial of service attacks, which on the large scale it's deployed to date, it, it affects the whole global internet infrastructure in some cases. And one can debate whether this is a you know, a utility for somebody at all, but possibly it could be your own government attacking somebody else. But it really affects the whole internet infrastructure. And uh, this is a problem that is not related to ecology, but, but we can see that this arises in other aspects as well. Uh, a third one that I think is interesting is uh, uh, high frequency trading on stock markets. High frequency trading uh, on assets is it's a really viable part of a stock exchange because it provides liquidity to the market and it decreases the transaction costs on market. So it's, you, you really want it to be there. But for example, the uh, a, a very classic example now is the 2010 flash crash on the New York Stock Exchange, where uh, I think it was the General Electric stock dropped dramatically on, on the, during the course of a few minutes, and this was also. Um, um, at least according to some people, a function of uh, high frequency traders utilizing the system in a, in a way it's not built for. So, but we also look at some, there are lots of people criticizing Harding's model for being way, way too simple. Um, one, uh, the best example is probably Eleanor Ostrom. Uh, she's the only woman yet to win the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. Uh, she has shown in her research uh, that a common research resource doesn't necessarily need to be either privately held or in governmental control to prevent it from going into a, like a tragedy straight transition. And she has shown that it's in the, in the interest of all the users of a, of a common resource uh, to keep it stable and to maintain it for long term, which is kind of inductive. Uh, but the, the most interesting thing she has shown is that uh, uncontrolled 
agents uh, that are commonly that are using a common resource uh, are shown to develop very complex schemes um, that they use uh, to maintain a common resource efficiently. So there are lots of examples where, where this is going on without any private or governmental influence. And there are also economic theories developed by other economists and political influences and they argue that the only viable solution to uh, prevent the tragedy of the commons is by private ownership. Uh, they argue that this creates a very strong incentive for the private owner to maintain the long-term value of the asset that you're holding. But on the contrary, uh, it could also be in the interest of a, primer, uh, of a private owner to exploit a, a, a resource with a short term uh, to, to maximize short term gain. So it's, it's, it's kind of a two way relationship, but it's, it's, it's under a lot of debate. Uh, Hardy's work has also been criticized as historically inaccurate. Uh, in failing to account for, for example, the demographic transition. It doesn't model that perfectly. Um, and uh, also for failing to distinguish between common property and open access to resources. Um, because we should definitely model this differently. And another one economist, uh, Dahlman, he argues that uh, commons has, uh, during history, uh, been very efficiently managed to prevent, for example, overbrazing, as in, in the cow example, uh, in, and which is kind of a contrary to, to Harding's theories. And other, further, other people argue that uh, the common land example we used previously in this, uh, in this presentation uh, is, should, should on historically, historical uh, ground be, be called uh, the triumph of the commons, uh, because there is lots of examples where successful uh, of successful common usage of land, um, and these people usually argue that uh, there are social changes and agricultural innovation that leads to the demise of commons, not necessarily the behavior of the commoners, but the people using it. Uh, and last, uh, some people argue that the tragedy of the commons example is just useless propaganda for, for common ownership. One economist, Derek Jensen, he says that uh, this has been used by the political right wing uh, to uh, uh, hasten the final enclosure of common resources in the third world and for native indigenous people. Um, and he argues that in, in true situation, those who abused the commons would have been born to desist and, and if they failed there would have been uh, punitive sanctions against them. And he says that we should rather look at this uh, not as being called the tragedy of the commons, but it should, uh, we should name this the tragedy of the failure of the commons. Dennis, do you have some conclusions on this? Uh, maybe. So, uh, some brief summary. <coughs> Uh, we talked about where it came from. It came from William Foster Lloyd, who first brought the idea on paper in 18, 1833. And then the American uh, ecologist, Gerd Hardin, he coined the term in his paper, and it was one of the most important articles and most, well, most commonly cited in the field of biology. And uh, we can see that the tragedy of the commons, they occur in uh, every almost everywhere, for example, tra traffic use and uh, Sparta, as we talked about, <coughs> uh, horrible deaths of lots of cults and populations and everything, we have done lots of that in uh, computational biology. Uh, and uh, you, you can uh, try to model this with uh, some sort of utility function, but all of these systems are pretty complex. So as a conclusion, it is hard to uh, find a direct call sometimes, and sometimes you don't know what the limit of your system is. Uh, for example, the Canadian fishermen, they, they, uh, they couldn't foresee that a tragedy would happen when they uh, fished this uh, important 
species for the ecosystem and then collapse the entire system in that area. Or when we started to use a lot of oil, we didn't really know that carbon dioxide affected the environment in such a way. So uh, sometimes it's hard to foresee these, uh, these limits to our resources. And also a general method is uh, uh, yeah, a general method how to prevent tragic commons is an open question because there is often no direct solution. As I hardly said, that the technical solution was one that uh, only needed to some change in the technical and natural sciences uh, and not a change in the morals or ideas of a human being. So. Uh, and the Harding also said, freedom in a commons brings ruin to all, which might be true to some extent, but uh, Eleanor Ostrom disproved this uh, by showing that, or didn't disprove completely, but to some extent that she showed that there were complex systems where the agents would uh, take care of a common resource to keep up the profit. Yeah, and then that wraps up, wraps up this uh, presentation. So, do you want to?